these diseases that involve these different proteins in the brain, I mentioned they all sort of have some problems with thinking, and some problems with behavior, and some problems with movement. We're not that good at telling them apart. But they have different treatments, we think, and different causes and uh, different prognosis, different predictions we have for each one. So very useful to try to come up with ways of looking in the living person, not in the brain. This is after they're dead. Very useful in the living person of coming up with ways. So there's different ways of uh, looking for biomarkers. It's a very hot neuroscientific area right now because of the weakness of us doctors. So very good to have molecular tools to help us. Uh, so some of these tools are imaging tools, pictures of the brain, some of which have molecules, I'll show you. Some of these are analyses of fluids, whether cerebrospinal fluid taken out of the back, or fluid taken out of the blood, or DNA made from blood cells. So there's different ways we can try to use markers, or discover markers. What I'll be talking about today are genetic DNA markers. But before I do that, I talk to you a little bit about the other markers, just so you've got an idea, have an idea of, uh, of some of these, other, of these other markers. This is an MRI machine, and this is the brain cut like this of a person who has Alzheimer's disease. But all you see is that a little bit too much fluid, not quite enough brain, a bit of brain shrinkage, not very specific. This is another brain, also quite a lot of fluid, but this is a different disorder. This is, you can see the difference. This person has black here and black here, it looks kind of even here, all white here and black here. This is what we call fluid buildup or hydrocephalus. Not, it's a type of degenerative disease, but not with any particular molecule, more from mechanical. This is another type of uh, picture. This is actually pathology here, just to compare. But this is the brain of somebody with frontotemporal dementia. I think you can all see that the shrinkage is mostly black as fluid. The shrinkage is mostly in the front. Rear part looks pretty good. But front part looks very shrunk. You can see that here, too. So that's what happens in frontotemporal dementia. So sometimes these can help us. In Lewy body dementia, typically the memory centers don't shrink as much as they do in Alzheimer's. And sometimes that can help us. Then we have fancier types of scans. We have scans of single photon emission computer tomography, which allows us to look at the brain blood flow, which shows us how well different parts of the brain are working. And there's Alzheimer patterns, and normal patterns, and frontal temporal patterns where the front part isn't working. In Alzheimer, the temporal part parts and back and front part working, but this part and this part are okay. Is it different from the usual uh, functional MRI? Ah, so functional MRI, there is one type of functional MRI that can give us pictures like this, that can show us function in the entire uh, brain. Uh, we call it arterial skin labeling. But the most functional MRI is a subtraction procedure, where you're simply asking which part of the brain is more active when you do a particular task compared to not doing that task. But you can use functional MRI to get maps like this too, and it's of interest because these techniques involve radioisotope, and if we could do it with MRI without any isotope, that would be better. So definitely that's an area of investigation also, is how to make maps like this using functional MRI. So this uses technetium isotope. This is 18 fluoro uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, so fluor radioactive fluorine, and this is PET scan, and I know you have PET scanner here across the street at Tokyo Women's. Uh, this is Alzheimer's disease, and this is frontal temporal dementia, where again the front is almost missing. We also have ways of looking at Lewy body dementia with these techniques. In Lewy body dementia, often enormous problem in the rear, rear part of the brain, occipital lobe, and then there's other types of spec that allow us to look at neurotransmitters in the brain and see that there's less neurotransmitter, less dopamine in the Lewy body brain. The most newest imaging markers are molecular neuroimaging. So just like some of you do circular dichroism or other optical techniques, 
um, to go and probe molecules. Here we're using ligands to inject a, a radioactive uh, ligand into the person. And while they're alive, we can see if that ligand binds to amyloid or doesn't. And, uh, and basically, the ligand gets all the way in through the brain barrier and binds to the little amyloid molecules. And we think it's pretty good at detecting Alzheimer's versus normals. This is one compound called A94972. This is another compound called 11 C B T A. So those are the sorts of imaging things we can do. Now, I said we can also look at cerebrospinal fluid, and I'm not going to talk too much about that, but I reviewed this. Well, I, mean, if I can give you a copy of this article. I reviewed this with a fellow and, uh, a couple of years ago. All the different molecules. And some of them are pretty good, but uh, some of them aren't so good. So different molecules go up or down in the spinal fluid, depending which disease you have. So now I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the new biomarkers and newer biomarkers we're looking at. And the two things I'm only going to talk to you about today uh, of my work are telomeres and a little bit about genetic markers. Telomeres, I think, tell us something not about any particular uh, degenerative disease, but more about aging itself, sort of a biomarker of aging. Because as you know, some people look a lot older than they are. Some people look a lot younger than they are. Most of us want to be looking younger. Uh, uh, of course, we all feel younger. But, uh, but telomeres, I think, tell you something about biological aging, about how old the cells and the body really is in some biological sense. Genetic markers help tell us who will get which diseases or has higher risk and maybe will help us uh, uh, in the treatment of these diseases. So the question is, why do people get dementia, period? We know that's partly due to aging. But why do some people get one disorder or another disorder? Or a different one? So let me tell you a little bit about aging and telomeres. We don't know exactly why we age. Of course, as years go on, we know we're older. But we don't know why there's any changes in our body or our brain or skin or all the different parts of our body or even in our thinking. Everyone knows that even normal old people think a little bit different. Some ways better, maybe some ways not quite as good. Certainly harder to learn a language uh, beyond a certain point. And it, I know it was much easier for me to learn French when I was 12 than it has been for me to try to learn some Japanese this year when I'm a little bit older. Um, but one factor about why we age may be in our telomeres. These bright spots through fluorescent in situ hybridization are the ends of our chromosomes, and we all maintain them without knowing it. And uh, if you want to display the telomeres in other ways biochemically, you can see that they consist of a ladder, lots of different repeated segments. And uh, it's repeated segments of these little hexanucleotides. Very complicated, but uh, in any account, overall, some people's telomeres stay about the same, but most people's get a bit shorter, as I'm going to show you. And sometimes telomeres may even get a little bit longer, and that may be good, unless you're a cancer cell, in which case it's bad. But uh, this is the biology of telomeres, and we're trying to understand exactly what it says about aging. And uh, this is a paper I published a couple of years ago, in which we started using a new Fancy assay. This was the old assay. It looks pretty chunky, right? Those of you who run gels, it doesn't look like much, right? But just smears. Uh, so, you know, people still do this. They try to calculate how many telomeres from the you know, size of this band and the position. Very hard. So now we use fancy 384 well, almost automated PCR machine. Very fancy. And we get very nice curves. These are from a couple years ago. And it correlates very well with. Uh, with measurements, but much less laborious, much easier on the PCR machine. We do lots and lots of controls and special samples and all sorts of things because it's a bit tricky because <laughs> these sequences are so repetitive, very hard to amplify, because so, so repetitive, the same six nucleotides over and over, over and over. 